Hello, this is R.J. Deacon, reading the Supreme Court of the United States opinion syllabus in Sveen v. Mellon, certiorari to the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, argued March 19, 2018, decided June 11, 2018. The legal system has long used default rules to resolve estate litigation in a way that conforms to decedent's presumed intent. In 2002, Minnesota enacted a statute establishing one such default rule. The statute provides that the dissolution or annulment of a marriage revokes any revocable beneficiary designation made by an individual to the individual's former spouse. Under the statute, if one spouse has made the other the beneficiary of a life insurance policy or similar asset, their divorce automatically revokes that designation so that the insurance proceeds will instead go to the contingent beneficiary or the policyholder's estate upon his death. The law does this on the theory that the policyholder would want that result, but if he does not, he may rename the ex-spouse as beneficiary. Mark Sveen and respondent K. Mellon were married in 1997. The next year, Sveen purchased a life insurance policy naming Mellon as the primary beneficiary and designating his two children from a prior marriage, petitioners Ashley and Antoine Sveen, Antoine Sveen, as contingent beneficiaries. The Sveen-Mellon marriage ended in 2007, but the divorce decree made no mention of the insurance policy, and Sveen took no action to revise his beneficiary designations. After Sveen passed away in 2011, Mellon and the Sveen children made competing claims to the insurance proceeds. The Sveens argued that under Minnesota's revocation upon divorce law, their father's divorce canceled Mellon's beneficiary designation, leaving them as the rightful recipients. Mellon claimed that because the law did not exist when the policy was purchased and she was named as the primary beneficiary, Applying the later enacted law to the policy violates the Constitution's Contracts Clause. The District Court awarded the insurance policy to the Sveens, but the Eighth Circuit reversed, holding that the retroactive application of Minnesota's law violates the Contracts Clause. The Supreme Court held, reversed and remanded, the retroactive application of Minnesota statute does not violate the Contracts Clause. That clause restricts the power of states to disrupt contractual agreements, but it does not prohibit all laws affecting pre-existing contracts. See El Paso v. Simmons. The two-step test for determining when such a law crosses the constitutional line first asks whether the state has operated as a substantial impairment of a contractual relationship. Allied Structural Steel v. Spanos. In answering that question, the court has considered to the extent to which the law undermines the contractual bargain, interferes with a party's reasonable expectations, and prevents the party from safeguarding or reinstating his rights. See El Paso, see Texas Incorporated versus Short. If such factors show a substantial impairment, the inquiry turns to whether the state law is drawn in an appropriate and reasonable way to advance a significant legitimate public purpose. See Energy Reserves Group versus Kansas Power and Light. The court stops after the first step here, because three aspects of Minnesota's law taken together show that the law does not substantially impair pre-existing contractual arrangements. First, the law is designed to reflect a policyholder's intent, and so to support rather than impair the contractual scheme. It applies a prevalent legislative presumption that a divorcee would not want his former partner to benefit from his life insurance policy and other will substitutes. Thus, the law often honors, not undermines, the intent of the only contracting party to care about the beneficiary term. Second, the law is unlikely to disturb any policyholder's expectations at the time of contracting because an insured cannot reasonably rely on a beneficiary designation staying in place after a divorce. Divorce courts have wide discretion to divide property upon dissolution of a marriage, 
including by revoking spousal beneficiary designations in life insurance policies or by mandating that such designations remain. Because a life insurance purchaser cannot know what will happen to that policy in the event of a divorce, his reliance interests are next to nil. And that fact cuts against the providing protection under the contracts clause. Last, the law supplies a mere default rule, which the policyholder can undo in a moment. If the law's presumption about what an insured wants after divorcing is wrong, the insured may overthrow it simply by sending a change of beneficiary form to his insurer. This court has long held that laws imposing such minimal paperwork burdens do not violate the contracts clause. It has repeatedly sustained so-called recording statutes, which extinguish contractual interests unless timely recorded at government offices. See Jackson v. Lamfrey, Vance v. Vance, Texaco Incorporated v. Short. The court has also upheld laws mandating other kinds of notifications or filings against contracts clause attacks. See Curtis v. Whitney, Gilfian v. Union Canal Corporation, Connolly v. Barton. The Minnesota law places no greater obligation on a contracting party than these laws, while imposing a lesser penalty for noncompliance. Filing a change of beneficiary form is as easy as satisfying the paperwork requirements that the court's prior cases approved. And if an insured wants his ex-spouse to stay as beneficiary, but does not send in his form, the result is only that the insurance money is redirected to his contingent beneficiaries, not that his contractual rights are extinguished. The decision is reversed and remanded. Justice Kagan delivered the opinion of the court, in which Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Kennedy, Thomas, Ginsburg, Breyer, Alito, and Sotomayor joined. Justice Gorsuch filed a dissenting opinion. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to have a conversation about any of the opinions, please find us on Facebook and join the Associated Conversation Group.